the video speaks for itself. Um, I heard a startling statistic just a few minutes ago that just in the Chino Valley area alone there's over 16,000 children of inmates. 16,000. And uh, outside when you leave tonight there will be a tree, a Christmas tree, and on the Christmas tree will have little bitty angels or about this big and on it will have names, I guess, and sizes and, and uh, ages of children. Grab one. We have 299 on that tree. And this video should show you that how much 
behind this project that we are here at Calvary Chino Hills. And we want you, everybody to be involved in it. And there's some things you need to know, so get your pencils out and write these down because we don't have very much time. We only have until the 8th for the presents to be here because we have to deliver them. And what we're going to do is we're going to use the call ministry to deliver them. We're going to use the prison fellowship ministry here to deliver them. And also, if you so feel led as a family to deliver them yourself, that's fine. Just let us know so that we, we, can, we understand what you're doing and we know where you're going. But that is the best way to do it. A family, ministering to a family. I don't really know of too many other opportunities of outreach where you'll affect so many people in such a deep way. And I mean not just one person like a one-on-one. We're talking about families here. We're talking about extended families who hear about this. You know, it's unbelievable how, how deep this can go. So we need to have the presence back by the 8th. I'm going to let you guys know that. Make sure you write that down. And we're going to give those out. And as the Lord leads you, we also give, with these things, uh, little outreach packages, uh, coloring books for the ages, uh, things. We're going to spread the gospel with it. And it's geared to their age group. So if you have a child, it's going to be, a, it's going to be geared to, to a child's uh, level of understanding about the gospel. But we're going to get the gospel out. And so this is what this is all about. So be in prayer about that, okay? Okay, at this time, I'd like to introduce to you in Jack's absence a great friend we have from down in Marietta. Uh, Thomas Powell is going to share with us tonight. Oh, God bless you. Good evening. What a blessing to be here again. Hmm. If you have your Bible, I hope you do. Turn to the Gospel of Mark, chapter 1. The Gospel of Mark, chapter 1, this evening. We're going to look at something in Mark here, and then we're going to look at Acts just for a couple of minutes, and then we're going to go to Ephesians. So, But I want to progress the uh, idea. I believe the Bible's making very clear. I'm just blown away. Every time I come here, the worship team seems to just sing my whole sermon. And I tell you, that last song that that we just sung about saying yes to the Lord. That's what I want to talk about tonight because I want to talk about you being a person after God's own heart who will do God's will. Something about doing the Lord's will. Something about, in all of us, the desires to do his will in whatever we face or whatever faces us in our lives. I was just thinking about an area in my own life that I'm in a time now where the Lord is teaching me and I'm in the center of a lesson that God is teaching about how important it is for me to seek his approval. How I'm to be sensitive and aware of the Lord affirming who I am and what I'm doing for him. It is so easy to try to achieve and attain that from other people and that's where the problem comes. I end up submitting myself to wanting and desiring other people's confirmation of who I am are the affirming from other people that that you're okay or this is good is good what you do the Lord's teaching me and I'm going to just encourage you what he's teaching me tonight about hearing from him the testimony that comes from the Lord speaking to your heart saying to you that you're his child and you're well pleased that's the first thing I want to look at is Jesus in the situation here and it happens right after he's baptized. In Mark chapter 1, I want to look at verse 9. It says here in verse 9, It came to pass in those days, Jesus came from Nazareth of Galilee and was baptized by John in the Jordan. And immediately, it says here, coming up from the water, he saw, Jesus saw, the heavens parting and the Spirit descending upon him like a dove. And then look what happens in verse 11. And then a voice came from heaven. Now we know who that voice is. It comes from Father God. It comes from the Father speaking to him. Peter confirms this in 1 Peter also. It says, 2 Peter, he says here, The voice of God says this to Jesus. You are my beloved son. 
in whom I am well pleased. It's interesting about this particular account because we see it in Matthew chapter 3 that John tries to fight with Jesus about letting this happen. Jesus comes on the scene there, and John knows, he sees, and he says, Behold the Lamb of God that takes away the sins of the world. And Jesus is standing there as if to say, Let's do it. Let's go. And John says, You know what? You ought to be baptizing me. I, I'm not even worthy to do this. And he's given this thing, and he's almost like resisting to do it. It talks about it in Matthew 3. And Jesus says this to John. We have to do this, for it is fitting for us to fulfill all righteousness. You should make note of that. Jesus is saying, John, we need to do this because this is God's way. No matter how uncomfortable it is to you, no matter how it may be putting you in a position that makes you feel less than worthy of doing it, the issue doesn't have to do how we feel, John. It has to do with what the Father wants us to do. And I want you to think about your own life in the areas that God is asking you to submit to. We just sung about that, saying, yes, Lord, I want to be obedient to you. I want to go against, and all of us want to go against the grain of our own feelings and be obedient to God and let him by his grace influence our hearts and have us live for him his way on his terms. So after Jesus gets John to baptize him, after the baptism, we see the heavens parting, the spirit descending, and then we see a voice coming. And that voice says, write to Jesus here, you are my beloved son in whom I'm well pleased. Now, I don't think at all when Jesus heard this voice that he said, oh, okay, I know that. Thanks. Jesus needed to hear that. It was important to hear that he was pleasing the Father. Now I ask you this evening, guys, how much do you long to hear these kind of words spoken to you? Is, it, is there a passion in your heart to want to hear the Father say, I'm well pleased in where you're at and what you're doing for me? It's an issue that has to deal with submitting to all righteousness and doing all the things, like Jesus said in Matthew 3, things that are fitting to fulfill all righteousness. How much is there a passion in your heart to do God's will? And how much even more is it for you to hear from the Lord that you have pleased him? You know, I look to the world to say that. I look to the world to validate who I am. I look to my own life and it ain't never going to be enough because there's always that going after that being accepted by those I love and by the world out there. But it's something about hearing it from Father God that begins to comfort our hearts. How much are you hearing God speak to you and how he feels about you where you're at in your life. Look over to Acts chapter 13, would you? Acts chapter 13. So the Father speaks to Jesus about how he's pleased with him. Now we're going to look at God speak about David and a testimony that comes from God concerning David. Acts chapter 13, verse 22. It says in verse 22, and when he removed him, he's talking about Saul there. For Saul was the king that they, they've asked for, it says in verse 21. But we know Saul lost his passion to do God's will. Saul seemed to begin okay seemed to begin to fear the Lord. But he, but he got careless and casual and cold to doing God's will. Didn't matter anymore. God said, kill them all. Saul says, I'll just keep some. Just a real kind of casual walk. And that kind of casualness ends up God making a decision in verse 22 to remove him. 
And after he removed Saul, look at verse 22, he raised up for them David as king, to whom he also gave testimony and said, and this is God saying this, I have found David, the son of Jesse, a man after my heart, and then notice what he said at the end of verse 22, who will do all my will. God says, I found David, the son of Jesse, a man after my heart, who will do all my will. I want you to make note of the fact is, he says, who will do all my will. I know you want this because I want it too. I want God to be able to say this about me. And I know he wants you to be able to say it about you too. That you're a person who's after, longing for what God wants. You know, David, we can see it his whole life, how he wanted what God wanted. He wanted to do God's will. And is there a fire that sparked in your heart tonight to want to do the Lord's will? We, we sang a song of just surrendering our lives to say, yes, we want to do that, Lord. Your kingdom come, your will be done. And in every situation, every circumstance, every relationship, every vision and pursuit that you have, will God say of you, I found a person after my heart. Let me tell you this. You ought to be seeking to hear that from the Lord. Or you ought to be seeking the opposite of that in his love of saying to you that you need to be more about my business. You're either moving in the will of God or you're not. And there's the fullness and the blessing and the fruitfulness that comes in moving in his will in all that we do and all that we face. How can you and I, how can you and I walk in the will of God? How can we be people after God's heart? In a world that's so different, in a world that's so contrary to what God wants, how can you and I go, I love the t-shirt, how can we go against the flow? Against the flow. Because that's your job. You're going against the flow when you're going God's word and God's way. In some cases, you are at your own homes. It's against the flow where you're going. How can you and I receive from the grace of God and his spirit and knowledge from his word to be people who will do all his will. How can we do that? Let's look at our focus tonight. Turn to Ephesians chapter 5. Ephesians chapter 5 verse 15. We see two incidents here where God speaks up and, and comforts people, one being Jesus, the next one being David, and makes a verbal expression that these two, Jesus and David, were after his heart, doing his will. He said about Jesus, he was pleased. There's comfort that come in our own hearts if we hear that from the Lord too. So in Ephesians chapter 5, verse 15, it gives us some neat points here. Three things here that we're going to consider tonight. Verse 15, see then that you walk circumspectly and not as fools, but wise. Verse 16, redeem the time, because the days are evil. Therefore, do not be unwise, but understand what the will of the Lord is. He says three things here. The first thing I want you to take note of is in verse 15. He says that we should walk circumspectly, not as fools, but wise. The word circumspectly there means to be walking exactly. It means to be walking accurately. It also means this in the Greek. It means to walk carefully. We are not to be bulls in china shops. Just busting through stuff and busting stuff down and oops, excuse me. We need to be people who totally take the time to walk accurately. Are you a person today who walks circumspectly? In everything that's before you, are you taking the time to let the Lord show you how to walk accurately, how to walk carefully, whether it's the raising of your children, whether it's the witness at your job, or 
just the enriching of your own marriage? Are you a person who's walking circumspectly and not as a fool, but as wise? Notice it says there, either you're walking circumspectly, you're walking carefully, or you're a fool. You're a fool. Talk to a guy who described it this way. After his marriage is now over, he's just about to lose his job, and he described it this way. He says, because of my foolishness, I let everything important to me just slip through my hands. Isn't that interesting? That word picture. It just, it just, I just let it slip because of my foolishness through my hands. All of us probably have in this room tonight situations that we have been in and we've allowed ourselves to hurt in those situations and it's because of our own foolishness where we have not been walking circumspectly. Let the Lord teach you tonight, guys. Let him teach, teach you in your li life tonight where you need to be walking more carefully, more accurately. Not just letting things carelessly put you in the pits. Have you ever found yourself in a pit? I tell you this, I found myself in most pits, and I'm looking, I'm deep in this pit, and I'm wondering, how did I get down here? And I look at the shovels in my hand. <laughs> Who did this? You know what one of the biggest, the biggest shovels I have is my mouth. I can dig some deep pits with this. And it's because I become a fool. I talk too much. This tongue, James says, like a fire. I burn stuff. But also, when I don't walk circumspectly, I've been, I begin to put myself in situations that I still have to pay for now. And in some cases, it's paying for with literal money. Or I made investments that I didn't walk circumspectly in seeking the Lord's will and way on that thing. We're going to find out and move in God's will. He says we have to, number one, here, walk circumspectly and not as fools. We, but as wise. How can we walk circumspectly? How can we walk wise? We sang about it tonight. Your words are lamp unto my feet and a light unto my path. Psalm 119, 105. I think I talked about that last time I was here. We are called to let the Lord lighten our steps illuminate our steps. So wherever we step, we step in where the word of God has lightened the pathway. Are you a person who's walking and letting God's word be a light to your feet? As you pursue things that are important to you, things that are precious to you, as you pursue long-term goals, are you letting the word of God become what shows you the way to get where you're going? If you're not, then you're walking. Listen, don't be offended. The Bible says it. You're walking as a fool. You're just foolish. You're no different than a man trying to find his way around a pitch dark room. You would say that man's foolish. Especially when he has available to him something that would turn the light on. And you and I have the word of God. And it's sad. It's so easy for us to think we can just blindly find our way. I can deal with this marriage situation. I'll just deal with it my way. And our way ends up making us fools. It ends up making us people who don't walk circumspectly. The next thing he says there in verse 16, says, redeem the time for the days are evil. Redeem the time for the days are evil. That word redeem there means to buy back. You're aware of that. It means to retain something that's been lost. The word time there means the season or the spirit of the world or the environment that we're in. So he's saying buy back what's been lost in this season, in this time. And it tells us what kind of season it is there. It says redeem the time for the days are evil. We're called to redeem the time and buy back time here in verse 16 by the way that we live. We are to redeem the time by right living. So number one, if we're going to be people who pursue God's will, number one, we have to walk circumspectly. Number two, there has to be an, always a redemption of the time, of the season. 
And he says here, the days are evil, and it sure is the case here today in our world today. If we're ever going to be able to achieve walking down his path and his way, there has to be that redemption of the time. Satan is taking everything that's given to him. And we need to walk right, live right, and do right. And redeem what God will have us redeem by the way we live. Jesus says, they would see your good works. And then when they see your good works, they would glorify the Father in heaven. It's interesting. Jesus said that the way people are going to get a vision of God is by how you and I live our lives. How you respond to situations in your neighborhood. How you respond to your teachers of your children. There's going to be an influence way beyond the influence that would come out of our mouths. It's going to come with how we live. And in a world that's going totally different than God, going totally away from the Lord, we need to redeem the time because the days are evil. Satan is, is just launching an attack full force in these last days. And we see it. We're, we all know, no one's ignorant to this. You know that the gang situation is happening around our community today. That has very little to do with crips and bloods and red and blue. That has to do with demons that are just totally taking control and got people killing people, have children killing people in a world today. The days are evil. And we see that kind of gang violence thing just getting out of control. No one's able to deal with it. And it's moving into cities. We're trying to move away, and it follows us. Because of the fact is that Satan is on such a campaign to destroy people and to destroy lives and to dampen any hope, any hope that Jesus is coming back in the lives of many people. Our moral decline today, not just our gang situation, but the moral decline in our country today, Satan is totally behind that, pushing that decline. He's pushing it. Look at where we come in such a short time. Look at what we allow to come out in literature and we legalize it. Look at the lack of morality that's embraced even by our leaders today. Satan is pushing that snowball of a moral decline that's getting larger and larger. We, the days are for sure evil. The days are evil also because Satan has duped people, has deceived people into seeking things in what they call the spirit world. You're aware of that. There's such a, a thing about that now, about people wanting to speak to other entities. No, I don't want to speak to Jesus. They say, let me speak to some spirit guy named Ralph or something. People are doing that kind of stuff. There's a, there's a more aware of a thing now that's happening where more people now are involved and most people in our country would believe there's life on other planets. And they'll believe in that easy. You, it's sad. You can go to people and you can go to them with the simple gospel. The gospel, listen, you're a sinner. Jesus came to save you. He went to the cross and he died there. He gave his life for you. The sinless son of God died for you so you can have eternal life. Do you believe that? They'll say, <laughs> you're in Disneyland. Jesus died for my sins? That's weird. And then Michael Jackson can be on Oprah. Oprah says, Michael, where do you get your rhythm from? I get it from the pulse of the universe. And people say, okay, that makes sense. The pulse of the universe. And people will latch on to that. People will take that and embrace that. But the truth of the gospel, they won't. They give over the stuff. We need to redeem the time. For the days are evil. The days are evil. The days are getting bad. By right living, again, we redeem the time. And we get things back from the devil. It's important for you to always have 
a redeeming thing happening, a redeeming process happening in your life, in any area of your life where you've been less than right in, that redeeming the time, it's always happening. Realizing there's so many influences today that are not of the Lord. I want you to just think about your own personal life and areas that God would begin to speak to you tonight about what you need to redeem because you have lost it. You've lost a something that was once precious. You've lost it in the eyes of your own children or your own family. No matter how little it may be. This, this Sunday, this Sunday, the Lord dealt with me on something that he had dealt with me a couple of years ago, but I was about to violate this thing again. Let me tell you how, what it was. And I want you to just think of yours, if, if you have anything like this. Here we are sitting in Sizzler. And, and, you know, you think after church, you know, you figure that's where God talks. He don't talk in Sizzler. You know, he talks in churches. Sitting there at Sizzler, I order a particular entree, particular dish. My wife orders the salad bar. Now, the law is, according to Sizzler, you can't eat off of someone else's salad bar place. Now, two years ago, I said, that's a stupid law. And I would just take the chicken wings off my wife's plate. My wife, because she's so spiritual dealt with me on that a couple years ago and and the Lord used her to deal with something as small as as at least as I thought at that time was small as that this Sunday I'm sitting in Sizzler my wife gets the salad bar she sits down and I say you know what I'm gonna get that chicken wing right there I'm gonna get that chicken wing but you know it's, it's kind of like you know you, you figure you know you're not faster than God and I'm going to see how quick I can get it and God don't see. <laughs> so you kind of fake it out, you know? As I begin to say in my mind, I'm going to get that chicken wing, <laughs> my wife noticed I was looking at the plate. <laughs> and, and she began to have a sense of being grieved in her spirit. I can see that I was hurting her. Because she really believed, and I sure was at the time, <laughs> going to get that piece of chicken. And because I saw her face and how grieved she was, and then I also began to see about what kind of example I was setting for my sons who were sitting right there, I had an opportunity to do something. I had an opportunity to redeem the time buy back the time. Now, you know what? I could easily say this, and I have said it. Everybody in Sizzler here doing it. Everybody's doing it. And I'm so glad I didn't do it Sunday. Another reason I'm glad I didn't do it Sunday, the waitress kept coming, and she kept looking at me, and I didn't know what it was. I thought she had a problem. Then she finally just blurted out, aren't you Pastor Thomas? <laughs> Thank you, Lord. Hallelujah. <laughs> I could have seen me picking chicken meat out of my teeth. Yes. <laughs> yeah, what's your name? <laughs> Would have been a bad situation, huh? I want you to think about your own, guys. I want you to think about any situation in your own lives where you need to buy back stuff that you've given away. Stuff that you lost. And you buy back it by living right. It may be a relationship that you need to mend, and the mending depends upon you, and you're going to do what's biblically right in that situation. It may be a situation where you need to trust God in, and all this time you haven't been trusting him. You need to redeem the time by doing right, for the days are evil. There's such a, a hard temptation that's on us all, man. It's on us all to consistently not be weary in well-doing. For in due season we shall reap if we faint not. I tell you, man, it's hard for all of us. because We're in a world today that keeps pressing temptation upon us to just take advantage of stuff. Just, just, just that's okay, everybody's doing it. You got your rights. The only right we got to do is the do right. The only right we got is to do right. Redeem the time. The last thing he says here is in verse 17 that we should understand 
what the will of the Lord is. Therefore, do not be unwise. Look at verse 17. Do not be unwise, but understand what the will of the Lord is. The word understand there means to know or perceive or to be able to take note of. And, and I want you to notice this because that, that is indicating here that if we're to understand what the will of the Lord is, then God wants us to know. Whatever you face tonight, whatever you have to face at your job or home or school tomorrow, and you're not sure, God has a will that he wants to have done. How you face struggles, circumstances in your life, the struggling circumstances, or how you face the fears of tomorrow. God has a will that he wants to get done in your life. It's important that you, by his great grace and his spirit, for you to understand what that will is. For you to be able to perceive and know and understand what it is so that you don't end up being, as it says here, unwise. Do not be unwise. Talked about it before when I was here. None of us can afford to be unwise when it comes to raising our children. In a world that will suck them into its system, none of us can afford to be unwise. You can't be unwise in your witness at your job. Because whether you like it or not, you, you know that's where God has you now. And God has called you to be a light in a dark place wherever you're at now. You can't afford to be unwise. In our lives today, God would say we need to understand what his will is. How do we understand what his will is? You know it. First of all, the word of God. The word of God. Let me just take this time. To, to encourage you to do something that I, I don't question you're not doing, but maybe we all just need a push from time to time, because I know I do. I need to be pushed to get more into the Word. <coughs> Excuse me. And let the Word get more into me. I need to be encouraged to do that. I need to be encouraged I need to be provoked to get more in the word. And I just ask you to be honest with your own self. Are you really a person of the word? Is the word abiding in you like Jesus said it should? Is the word of God rooted in you? Is the word of God, like Paul said, dwelling richly in you? Is the word of God, like we said earlier, is it a lamp unto your feet? No, and you know the answer to that. And it's easy to just kind of like say, yeah, I'm going to get to that. But more than you need anything else, you need the Lord to just spark a desire to have you hunger for the word. And maybe after tonight, you may want to get with somebody and ask someone to just intercede for you. Just pray for you, that you get an, a hunger for the word of God again. None of us can afford to try to communicate any life in our lives. And in those who are involved in our lives, we can't afford to think we can communicate without the word of God, without the precepts and the principles from scripture. And it's one thing to be holding the word of God in your hand, Man, it's another thing to be holding it in your heart. And I ask you just to examine your heart tonight. And don't lie against the truth. If you're not in the word, then cry out to God to give you a hunger for it. My whole life and my whole vocation revolves around communicating the word. But I struggle just like anyone else struggles with the personal devotional time with the Lord. You know, when I, I can easily try to say, and God always gets me on this. Well, you know, I studied for this Bible study I did at Calvary Chapel. God says, that don't count. <laughs> it don't count for time with me. And I, used to, I think it's like comp time, you know. And it don't chalk up. 
He wants me to come to him because I love him, not just come to him because I want to do a Bible study on Wednesday night at Calvary Chapel Chino Hills. It's got to be, got to be a desire. And I struggle with that too. And it's an ongoing, Lord, help me hunger for your word. If we're ever going to understand what the will of the Lord is, we're going to have to let this book get into us. Get into us. And let this book become alive and active in every part of our lives. So number one, how do we understand what the will of the Lord is? The Bible. The Bible tells us God's way and God's will. Number two, the Holy Spirit. Jesus said in John chapter 14, 26, write that down, would you? John 14, 26. Jesus said this, the Holy Spirit, he will teach you all things. He will teach you all things. There's things that you need to be taught, and the only way you're going to get them is by way of the Holy Spirit teaching you those things. David said, Lord, teach me your way. Show me your path. David knew that God had to teach him that. That it had to be in the school of God. Jesus says the Holy Spirit will teach you all things. I wonder how much tonight are you just submitted to the teaching of the Holy Spirit in your life. And do you sense and do you feel and do you know when he's speaking to you and when he's not? I'm very grateful, even though I joke about it, I'm gr very grateful that the Holy Spirit has entry into my life, even at a sizzler, and dealing with chicken wings. I'm, I'm really glad about that. And I know you are, even when the Holy Spirit begins to deal with you on little stuff. Because there's a sensitivity that you have, and praise God you have it, that he can say, no, that's wrong, or yes go this way. Yes, I want this for you. No, that's not for you. I, I want to always see the flashing of the yellow caution lights to tell me to slow up. I want to see the red lights from the Spirit to say stop. And I always want to see the green lights when he's saying this is the way we go. I'm going to teach you this way. I know you want to see those too. But it's surrendering and submitting to him and letting him lead us and ask you to be open to the Holy Spirit and his guiding and his moving. You know, we, when we talk about spirit fullness, we end up moving right across a lot of things and going into the manifestation of the spirits and the gifts of the spirits. And I believe in all that, and I know you do too. And praise God for the gifts of the spirit. But a lot of times we think that that's where it's at and that's where it needs to be. There's a lot of other things that Jesus said he would... He would convict you. He will guide you. He will comfort you. He will speak to you the things that are to come. Man, there's a lot of things that I kind of like try to just blow off that the Holy Spirit wants to minister to me. I wonder how open you are to him leading you and guiding you. I need the Holy Spirit to teach me how to raise my boys. I'm a fool. I'm a fool if I think I'm going to have calculate some kind of plan to raise them up in the world today. I need the Holy Spirit to teach me how to love Pamela like Christ loved the church. I can't do it of myself. He has to teach me. I need the Holy Spirit to teach me how to deal with people I can't stand. Because my way ain't working. Teach me how to love people. That ain't on my Christmas list this Christmas. I need him to teach me. I need him to tell me. I need him to instruct me. So the Bible and then the Holy Spirit. He's the one that helps us.
Ciao. I just wish I could have heard him say, you were doing good. And all during this wish list, this little six-year-old grandchild is looking up at her uncles and aunts and mommy and daddy in their, in their depression and distress because they were wishing something from, from their father. She opened her mouth and said these words, only like a grandchild could say. She says, everything you're asking for, Jesus will give you right now. I wonder if it's enough for you if he gives it to you right now. Is it enough for you to want to hear Jesus say, well done. I love you. I'm pleased with you. You're a person after my heart. Do you long for that? Do you desire that? Or are you trying to get it from other people, even people who are dead now? We only should want to hear it from the Father. Hear from the Father and let that comfort us. And let that bring confidence for another day. Because the only confidence we can have is when you hear from God and God says, you're my child in whom I'm well pleased. Let's pray. So Lord, we want to open our hearts to you tonight. Lord, I, I thank you for the opportunity just to bear my own heart concerning the lessons you're teaching me about always looking to other people to validate my life. And Lord, I, I'm pretty sure, I don't think I'm taking a guess at this, I'm pretty sure there's other people out here tonight who have sought, just like I have, confirmation from other people when we need to be seeking it from you. Lord, it's your will we want to do. We want your kingdom come and your will be done. We want to be able to say yes to you, Lord. So Father, help us by your grace to walk circumspectly, to redeem the time, and to understand what your will is. We're in the last days and you have invested in us, Lord, light and salt to shine and to spread in this great world. A world that desperately needs you and you called us. So Lord, I just pray for Calvary Chapel Chino Hills and I pray, Father, for their pastor and for this congregation, that they would always understand what your will is for them. That they would walk in the confidence of knowing that your word is a lamp to their feet. And they would always pursue what you have before them. So we thank you tonight for your word. Now, Lord, let your word leap off of these pages and let them be rooted in our hearts that it may bear fruit of action in our lives. By your grace now, may we receive your word and may we live it. In Jesus' name, amen.